Welcome to How Clinton Built the West, uh, our little attempt to provide some content during the, the shutdown. And we're going to take a journey through all the different stages that were needed to turn Clinton, which is on the riverfront, into the sawmill capital of the world. Uh, this map here shows where the land and the river was. And all those little black dots are where Clinton's leading sawmills were in the 19th century. Let's just say from 1870 to 1895. The little stars are where the Sawmill Museum is today there on Main Avenue and then uh, Jefferson Elementary. And we'll get back to all of the, the black squares uh, by the end. But why Clinton became a, a sawmill is best shown in this map here. That shows what uh, how much virgin timber there was throughout all the United States and the different time periods. Of course, when the first white settlers came, um, most everything east of the Mississippi uh, was heavily forested. Uh, by 1850, right around when Clinton's uh, getting going, you can see, the, especially in the Northeast, uh, just how little virgin timber there was. But most importantly for us, you can see that west of the Mississippi um, is no longer, um, or there are no trees to speak of. So if you are going to be living in any of these states and you needed uh, lumber to build a house, well, that's where Clinton kind of figured it out. One little note, most of the deforestation uh, occurs because of agricultural clearing, and then, of course, what they need the most of, fuel. Um, and really what Clinton was able to do, and this, this line graph shows the best, is control at 1869 to 1899, so the lake states. And then, really, when you look at it, the south and the west, when you see where did these companies go after 1899, a lot of Clintonians uh, go south and west. So really, as we're going to get at, is just how central of a role Clinton and really the Mississippi River Logging Company uh, was in production. You often hear things like, oh, Iowa or Clinton cut the most lumber anywhere. And this bar graph shows a, just actually the how little uh, lumber was actually cut here in Iowa compared to the rest of the North Woods. Of course, Michigan's going to be outproducing all of us combined. Uh, by us, I mean Iowa, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And we'll get to that, how the Mississippi River Logging Company, which was headquartered here in Clinton, kind of controlled all three of those states. Um, but once again, you know, Wisconsin, Minnesota is where they're producing a lot of the lumber. Clinton's responsible for about a third of what's cut in Iowa. And really why Clinton had sawmills uh, kind of goes to the little, this little map here. The rail coming over Little Rock Island uh, allowed for uh, markets to be reached. You had wonderful river flows and sloughs and just very good prime real estate with the river and the rail to build uh, a lumber empire. But the real reason is the Mississippi River Logging Company, or the Beef Slough, about 210 miles north of here, uh, where basically Alma, Wisconsin is, uh, we took over and drove about a billion board feet of, of logs out of there every year. And then, of course, we're going to slowly take over all of the, the timber in Wisconsin and then Minnesota and build sawmills in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and kind of force everybody into the Mississippi River Logging Company and its various different names. This here is a map of what lions look like. Initially, in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, there was current-driven log graphs coming down the river. And so you can see what lions used to look like. By the 1880s, it's mostly steamboat-driven traffic. This here is a map of Clinton. You can see the rail bridge again, the roundhouse, and all the logs piled up along the river. That green dot's where our, basically our pool is today. Of course, not when it zooms in. And once again, it's the rails. So down in the Quad Cities, you have a little guy called Warehouser, and he can take advantage of the Rock Island line. Here we have the Chicago Northwestern. This here's early picture. By the 1880s, you can just see 
how much of Clinton is connected to Wyoming, Colorado, Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, um, and then even through Wisconsin and Minnesota, a complete supply chain. Oversimplifying, it was almost as expensive to go from Chicago to Clinton as it was Clinton to, uh, let's say, you know, Colorado or um, and things like that. So that's another reason why it was very prime to bring those logs and lumber down from Wisconsin to established rail connection points and get that lumber out everywhere. A cleaned up version of that map once again shows uh, Clinton and Dubuque and Davenport and all the different lines that could be connected. A little side in the 1940s during World War II uh, Clinton's women uh, were on the forefront of keeping commerce alive as they become Rosie the Riveters. And you can see these photos just about everywhere. But it was these big steam locomotives that were uh, going to make Clinton a central player in the lumber industry. But you had to get logs. And that's where our story starts, is how we got logs from Wisconsin and Minnesota. Uh, before settlement, this was the diversity of the North Woods. You can see just the, 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 the rich biodiversity of all the trees. And really, we're looking at the central and northern part of, of Wisconsin. And, you know, a little, little north of the, the oak forest, the, the tan part. And as a result of the Mississippi River Logging Company and various entities, uh, you have uh, this picture here. And, you know, basically, we took out all that green and either cut it into lumber there or send it down the rivers um, and things like that. But it was really owning all of that timber. That was the uh, idea of Weyerhaeuser from the Quad Cities, the president of the Mississippi River Logging Company. Joyce Young and Lamb, Clinton leading lumber barons, were the, usually the largest shareholders. And eventually all but Knapp Stout in Wisconsin are in essence going to be part of this, uh, what we'll just call monopoly in Wisconsin and eventually Minnesota. Key difference in Michigan, they stay independent owners and, and whatnot, whereas once again, basically Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois was just a handful, a dozen or plus um, really large interest. A lot of people ask, what were the forests like? The trees were super tall, but they were not necessarily very wide. In one source, the average width was about 18 inches. But they loved trees like this that had basically 80 feet of largely uh, limbless trunk because you could cut that tree down and cut it into five 16-foot logs. Once again, uh, it shows you kind of the, what the forest looked like in the North Woods. I really love the, the, the scale that's there. I mean, you can see a, a two-man saw up, up there. And, of course, the first thing you did is you built a, a logging camp, cleared some logs, built a camp, and then you would clear the forest around it. And you would do this during the winter. And one of the things that Weyerhaeuser loved to do was actually go up there and kind of look. While the axe is the most famous tool of the trade, and you can kind of see one there. It was really the two-man saw uh, that did all the, all the work and should get all, all the glory. One of the most important jobs in the lumber camp uh, was the saw filer. You can imagine you wanted a nice sharp edge all the time. And once they cut the, the logs, they had to load them on horse sleds. This here is a, uh, shows you how in a basically a poorer camp or an earlier camp, or just a simple version of using, you know, basically cut boards to roll the logs up. There would sometimes be pegs in those in case you needed to take a break. Guy on top would all winch them down. It, once again, this work was usually done in the winter, so they had all these logging roads throughout Wisconsin and Minnesota, and these horses could bring the, the logs to riverbeds that were frozen over. And the most important job, or I shouldn't say the most important, but the craziest job, uh, was the sprinkler or the icer. Basically, these poor couple of guys went out in the middle of the night and actually literally sprayed uh, the logging roads and then cut grooves in for the log sleds. The log sleds usually weighed about five tons or so. Could not imagine in the middle of the night doing this job. 
Why you see a lot of pictures like this, if you read the, the notes there, a lot of times they were staged. They were either purposely staged or sometimes they had contests like a tractor pool to see the largest load a horse team could pull or, you know, uh, different things like that. A great kind of uh, mosaic of the different pictures. You can see all the different ways they move logs and it was really just a, an amazing amount of, of work usually done all in the winter. And of course, what was left? Uh, this is a great representation. Is, you know, they were basically clear cutting. They cut down all the trees and moved on to the next stand, which is why it was so important to own timber. And so how the Mississippi River Logging Company in essence came to own timber is that W.J. Young's benefactor was a guy called McGraw from Ithaca, New York, who was a benefactor to Cornell University. Cornell University has a bunch of log land in Wisconsin. So in 1870, when they try to create the Mississippi River Logging Company, some early seed timber comes from there. I really like these pictures because while technically women and children weren't in the camps, you know, that was really based on the early camp life. As more and more immigrants came in, uh, women and children joined the camps or they lived just outside the camp. Uh, various different histories, um, but really when you look, my favorite version of this is when they went and did like a census in the woods, they didn't find any women, and yet there's countless diaries and pictures uh, showing women and children. Uh, and it was just a, a really good um, thing. One of the things they thought they were doing, right, is clear cutting uh, to allow for farming, and of course you already have some ready-made houses. Um, but didn't always work out the best. Really good picture, uh, really a more typical log sled and a lumber camp or a logging camp uh, there in the middle of the winter. Uh, quite amazing. Eventually, you know, Shea locomotives and things like that are going to, you know, try to replace a lot of this, but that's really more after uh, Clinton's guys get done with the North Woods. And once again, you know, this is what's kind of left. This was all forested, mainly pine logs, and it was pine logs that was needed to turn into lumber to build houses and businesses and things like that. So once again, 1870, the, the guys down here, Warehouser, Joyce, Young, Lamb, and others created the Mississippi River Logging Company, which uh, stage one is to control the timber. So buy timber, have logging crews, and then control the rafting. And this here is a great picture of the beef slough. You can see right there in the center where it was, all those little waterways that you could build rafts in and actually go right into the Mississippi River. Just a little, again, a little north of Alma, Wisconsin. Uh, this here is the, the heart of the operations. Uh, actually, some Michigan owners tried to do this. They kind of ran out of money, so lots of backstory. And once again, 1870, uh, we're sitting down here going, this would be a perfect place for rafting networks. They all had different tools, um, some real fun things. The one that always st stood out to me is the caulk boots. Uh, basically, obviously, if you're running on logs, you needed a, a special boot to help uh, gain traction, more or less cleats. Uh, but uh, I don't think baseball players today probably fix their own cleats too much, uh, but they might. Uh, what's really bizarre to me is this is all occurring right after the thaw, the river drive. So as the snow melts, they need to move the logs into um, basically the river to get to the rafting networks, the sorting networks. And so these guys would go out and move logs uh, basically in sub water like this. This is just uh, bizarre to me. Uh, had to have been a very, very tough job and how big some of these logs could get. Uh, rough water, rapids, and different things like that. And of course, this is how the sport of log rolling developed. Uh, you had uh, basically people who uh, were doing this to survive, right? As you're hopping from log to log, um, and quickly they realized crowds could build up. And then if you have a crowd, you might as well kind of do a formal event and charge for it. But this was life or death for them at first. We have a video game here at the museum that really kind of tells Stephen Hanks story. He's the first and last ra river raft pilot or log raft pilot on the river. In essence, 
Uh, Stephen Hanks in the 1840s is a young whippersnapper who takes a log raft from Stillwater to St. Louis, uh, roughly a 30-day round trip with the bulk of that bringing a floating log raft down river. He started in the Beaver Channel and decided that he was going to be the first one. This here is lumber rafts. Um, but you can see a log raft in essence worked the same as guys lived on the, the raft and they actually steered them with giant oars and took them through the tributaries of Wisconsin all the way down. Uh, LeClaire and Keokuk, you had rapids. It was very, very, very tough work. Of course, they're sleeping on the rafts, eating on the rafts, drinking from the river, eating largely from the river, um, peeing in the river and different things like that. Uh, it's definitely a... a something that I could do once until I probably had to lift one of these giant 16 18 foot oars and actually try to sweep uh, and keep the raft in the current or, or in the channel uh, then I would probably uh, uh, call it quits but it did actually occur especially around the Wisconsin Dell area these kind of very aggressive rapids the rapids in LeClaire and Keokuk were long and drawn out and just as dangerous um, but they weren't going to be kind of your, your white rapid rafting. But they did have to do this, and they would break these log rafts into small pieces. Uh, they would pull over uh, at night and eat and, and sleep. Uh, once again, a beautiful picture of, of going through a smaller river. But just how big those oars are. And then eventually, they're, right, they're all driven by steamboats. And actually, the, the, the brilliance of the Clinton loggers is that they created a thing called the braille system. They actually basically made little cribs of logs and those cribs were then tied together into a large raft and those cribs can be broken into pieces as they came down river. Uh, every log had its own mark and so you knew which sawmill it was supposed to go to and you didn't have to live on the rafts and you, know, you can see how they're all kind of tied together with chain and and larger logs, uh, they're kind of like tie straps. But, you know, another example of, you can see up close just the different um, ways they were actually able to secure these log graphs and really just how big uh, these log graphs were, you know, a couple of acres. Uh, just a really good picture. Uh, you walk out on the log graphs. Sadly, if you look at Clinton's newspapers, a lot of people drowned this way. They would come and fish off the rafts and things like that. And of course, if the log opened and you fell in, it closed on top of you. Not the best solution. Uh, our swing bridge, a really cool picture. The Van Zant is a very important name. Uh, he was a basically a, a maker and a pilot from Leclerc. Uh, Warehouser was a... a, a one of his main business partners. Once again, a great look at how these cribs were created and then tied together, uh, and just how long. The boat in front actually helped steer the log raft as it came down river. So you had the, you know, the, the tow, you know, in essence, pushing and to help steer. And Lamb invented an engine that helped actually kind of steer the, the, the entire log raft. And just another version of that picture, once again, the, the dual boats, a little bit smaller uh, coming down. One of the th cool things about Clinton is we had the upper Mississippi River's only female pilot. There's a great article out there um, about that, but that's a, a pretty cool story. And of course, now the log graphs are down here, and so um, we'll take a little journey through uh, where the sawmills were and what they are today. N very far north, basically 35th Avenue South, you have Garner, Batchelder and Wells, and Lyons Lumber Company. You can see what this is today. A lot of people know about the Pennsylvania Tire Company. Remember that one of the office buildings is still a um, an apartment. A little further south of there, but still in Lyons, Joyce Lumber Company. Uh, that's their office building where Bargain Bonanza was. You have Joyce's Slough and various things like that. And it was uh, up until the 1970s, pretty hopping. Uh, where Clinton Lumber Company sat is where our pool basically was, more or less. Um, but uh, when this, the Hosfords owned that, and when they went out of business, you know, they did make sure that this became a green space. But really, the epicenter of it, though, is the Young and Lamb Mills south of the rail bridge. Uh, this here 
you know, that were giant mills. There were six of them in total. Lamb had four and Young had two. Um, and they just produced an, an amazing amount of lumber. Um, and they're usually the largest shareholders of the Mississippi River Logging Company. And once again, what's crazy is, you know, all these guys also had mills in Wisconsin and Minnesota that produced, uh, usually someone like Joyce actually produced two, three times as much lumber. Um, but once again, connecting all of those points south of the rail. And then, you know, Lamb was also more or less behind where uh, ADM is today. That picture's pretty close to where they were. And then, of course, the heart of the operation really was the, the rail and the sorting networks that you could have all the lumber come and be sorted and sent out uh, where basically Comanche Avenue is, more or less. Great picture of Mr. Peanut that everybody remembers. Um, of course, when I moved to town, uh, they were just finishing up Comanche Avenue. A great picture of the different rails, the roundhouse, and, and things like that that really made Clinton such a central part to the, the nation's economy, uh, especially if you're trying to send out lumber. And these pictures are, are of course, after the lumber boom um, here in the, in the base of the 1900s. But once again, some good pictures. So who were the, the lumber barons? Now, first you have Lamb, uh, Jane Lamb Hospital, the YWCA, many different uh, uh, things. That's Chauncey. He had sons Lafayette and Artemis. And then James Dwight, what is his grandson, was pretty popular. Then you have David Joyce, his son William, and then William's sons, James and David. And they used to own Eagle Point Park and own the cemetery, and their houses still stand there uh, next to the administration building on 3rd and 19th. Uh, of course, the last heir was Beatrice Joyce, and they're now, when she passed away in the 1970s, they're now a billion dollar foundation and Chicago. And then you have uh, W.J. Young. The, that family still owns Clinton National Bank. And what's really kind of interesting when you look at kind of the impact that's still being made, of course, is that, you know, I think it's a half a billion dollars worth of assets there for Clinton National Bank. So it's not as if this money has just completely disappeared. I always talk about Essek and prolonged presentations. He's a great worker story. He loses his arm and leg uh, kind of gets better, becomes the city treasurer in 1900. But yeah, basically in 1880, uh, he's just a young man uh, working at W.J. Young's sawmill and while cleaning up sawdust, gets picked up by the track and loses his, his arm and leg. How did sawmills work in Clinton? Of course, you had to get the logs here first. They were generally stored uh, there off the channel and they had different storage units over in... Illinois side as well. Once again, south of the rail bridge, you can see the big smokestacks and, and all the different machine shops that were needed to make things in-house and the fleet of boats to help move logs and just a huge operation. Here's, you know, when they're full of logs, the conveyor belts there to basically bring the logs into the mill to be processed. This is not that same picture, but to give you another idea of how these logs could be loaded. Big cordless steam engines powered the mills. These are two, three, four, five hundred horsepower steam engines. Apparently there's only one left in, at the Henry Ford Museum of a steam engine that was made while Corliss was alive. Corliss also made a big safe for Clinton National Bank. And you'll see a lot of these through history, all these interconnections. But once again, big, huge steam engines. Um, they just got bigger and bigger and more powerful uh, to run all the belts needed to, to, to cut. And really, uh, while, you know, band saws would come into the 1880s, uh, this here's a version of the gang saw, not the best version of what Clinton's look like, but I've never been able to find what an actual inside of a Clinton sawmill uh, looked like. I read plenty of descriptions you know, oftentimes they were basically blade set in predetermined widths and you could just push logs through. Uh, they claimed in three minutes you could hook a log in the holding pond and bring it through the gang saw and then stack it as lumber in the lumber yard. And you know, once again, lots of waste, lots of uh, uh, stone and wood, and of course just a fire hazard waiting to happen. By 1900, though, uh, pretty much all the big sawmills are closed here in Clinton or on their way out. 
Um, but once again, once I got into the yard, it all shipped out west uh, this year, you know, basically a little switcher train, if you will, moving those uh, log stacks around. And of course, what did it do? Uh, you know, they built their houses uh, on 5th and 6th Avenue and of course all lined with elm trees before the elm disease came and, and took it over. Uh, this is W.J. Young's, or sorry, W.T. Joyce's house. Uh, they are the Joyce Mansion. That's by 3rd and 19th by the administration building. Of course, it was originally the East Lake design or a very Victorian design. And then they kind of took all that and added a different design in the 1920s. The family themselves got tired of everything breaking. And then, you know, right next to the big lumber mansions were uh, the, the employees' houses. A lot of them were more or less shotgun houses, you know, South Clinton, Riverside, uh, kind of around the big tree and things like that. A very wonderful view of basically what, uh, you know, Clinton would look like. Um, you know, no lock and dams and there are no levees. Uh, you know, you didn't have the, the river road there, basically direct access to the river. This is what Main Avenue looked like. You can see Pape was uh, a long time business it looks very dirty um you know you didn't basically had you didn't have pavement and cement and all that or concrete but it was a really uh, an amazing picture and a lot of these kind of uh you know goes way back to the different foundings and of course they had uh, inner urban rail in different ways to street cars to get from Clinton to Lyons and even Clinton to Davenport and other places um just lots of different ways of, of, of getting around town, lots of businesses. Um, a lot of these buildings are very familiar. They're still standing in Clinton and Lyons. But for me, uh, what was quite evident is that, yes, there's one, lots of great houses and lots of great businesses, um, but you also had a very interesting uh, uh, inter intermixing of different cultures and alcohol, lots and lots of bars. And really what would happen, as this shows, is when the, basically the lumber rafts arrived and intermixed with the sawmill workers, it was quite a day for the police. And so you had these heavy investment and the police force uh, to basically try to, to, to keep a handle on, oh, you know, a bunch of 18 to 22 year old uh, drunk men. And then, as I alluded to about the fact that Everything is basically a fire hazard, a fire trap. A lot of your 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 early, you know, basically fire department, if you will, were heavily funded by the Joyces and the Lambs and the Youngs. Um, they were honorary captains at first, and really it was basically neighborhood watch uh, version. You would go to the the rail, you would go to the lumber yard where most of the fires would occur. You'd put out that um, before you went to your house. Um, of course, the most famous. String of fires in 1968. I'm gonna have to change this when the new school's built. Um, but you know, it's also you know, this is all pre-lock and dam, so you know, the, it was just a completely different uh, you know way you engage the river. This is what Eagle Point Park used to look like. Um, of course, now it's the widest point on the river, or one of the widest points. Um, where our dog park is today, we had a little mini zoo. We even had monkeys. Uh, a lot of people remember that. Uh, then being on the river, we, really Clinton County as a whole was a, a very Im important part of Iowa's underground railroad system, but it seems like a lot of it was actually south of Clinton, uh, more DeWitt in the western part of the county. Um, but there are, of course, some underground railroad houses. One of the most famous people that actually got a probably a start in the sawdust piles, his dad was a carpenter, he might have even worked briefly, because you could start working at 10, 11 years old in the sawmills. Uh, Felix Adler goes on to be the clown. Uh, of course, Duke Slater, another great early uh, person that's basically, uh, you know, coming about, coming of age post-lumber boom, basically taking advantage of this transition from uh, a, a lumber center to uh, basically something else. Why are there no more sawmills in Clinton? Well, the biggest reason is in 1893, there was a giant recession. People weren't building houses. Uh, there had been multiple recessions. They've been able to survive. But really, um, 
1893, the workforce is drying up. The lumber barons themselves start passing away. Uh, they've moved south and west or are looking to move south and west. So like Gardner, he goes to Laurel, Mississippi. The Joyces had acquired a bunch of southern yellow pine. Lamb and Weyerhaeuser go west. Weyerhaeuser gets a great deal from his neighbor up in Minnesota, 900,000 acres of virgin timber for $6 an acre. Uh, you can't beat that deal out in the state of Washington. So yeah, uh, basically there's no work. They've cut a lot of the, the wood. They have new markets. The rails are connecting a lot of things. And of course, when they're passing away, their kids move on to different things. And one of the, just the constant things I think had to make some impact, especially being on the river, was really just an uncertain, uh, basically supply line. Uh, with the constant floods. These are pictures from the 1880 flood, which, funny enough, actually probably helped cement us as the lumber capital. After 1880, up in Wisconsin, a bunch of Wisconsin guys' logs gets deposited in the beef slough, and as a result, uh, we all join forces and, and become like the Chippewa uh, Logging Company or the Chippewa Boom Company. Um, and then 1885, because we have such power, they all meet here uh, and Clinton to figure out how to start dividing up Minnesota. Um, but what it really did have a huge impact. Um, 1965, of course, uh, is the biggest one in terms of its kind of, it's the last one. So that's why it's the biggest one. Not necessarily the biggest flood, even though it is. Um, it's really a, just a, a complete remaking of Clinton's riverfront. Um, and so, you know, Curtis Company is there and they're flooded and the W.J. Young machine shop is still there, but we're gonna build the levee and clean up the river. And what replaced sawmills? Here in Clinton, you know, basically uh, value-added production of, oh, eventually corn syrup and sugars and then cellophane. And of course we got Lyondell and various things today. You know, basically still processing a raw material into something. Um, but, you know, it all kind of goes back to this just, uh, you know, really interesting, right? 1868, you have, um, you know, these early orders, and you can go to the University of Iowa, and you can, you know, see these, you know, basically the, the beginnings and, you know, all, all the different markets that Clinton could meet, you know, the Platte Valley Grain and Lumber Company. You know, people always looking for jobs that were coming to Clinton, Um one of my favorite little side stories, of course, is uh, uh, Cortland, which is W.J. Young's son, interaction with Henry Sabin. Iowa had a very good education system, and uh, Cortland did not necessarily take advantage of that. Um, and, and simply, uh, you know, very early on, uh, the, they, they realized something, and that was a very dry, a big driving force behind, in essence, the competitiveness of Clinton's lumber capital. You know, the American people must learn that a forest, whatever its extent and resources, can be exhausted in surprisingly short space of time through total disregard in its treatment. Really meaning uh, that, you know, basically there was always a new log source, always a new timber source. It was always the next, 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 always looking forward um, to, you know, basically the next year's quotas, even that day's quotas, you know, instantaneous communication and trying to secure a production line. And, of course, you know, it's interesting you have that. And, then of course, you have the button industry right afterwards. And really the river was, you know, highly changed because of the logging industry. Um, in fact, the river was pretty much just good for, for log rafts and, and pearl buttons for there for a while. And then of course, this the renaissance, the rebirth is the lock and dams, the uh, more and more industry being built right here on the river and rail. And it always goes back to the river and rail. And that is Clinton's lumber story in about 30 minutes. So this is almost like a documentary went pretty fast. Hopefully you can visit sometime soon to see the sawmill in person. I can tell you these stories in a little bit more detail, but thank you for joining me.